Our scripture reading this morning, I'm going to be using a lot more than this, but there's two stories I want you to hear. Exodus 3, 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He had led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire out of a bush. And he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And God said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And the cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppressed them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Ooh, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will go with you, and this will be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. And Moses said, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of our ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is the name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent you, has sent me to you. And God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The God, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations the burning bush. The other scripture I want to read to you about is the story of Lazarus being raised from life. This is in John 11, and I'm just parsing pieces of that story. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair, and her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death, but rather to God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Insert, we all know what happened, he died. Starting verse 38. And then Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. And Martha, the son of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he's been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. I'm going to be dealing with some metaphors today, in case you haven't heard that. So, My message today is sepulchers, lepers, and burning bushes. So we're going to grapple with some of those metaphors and see what we come up with today. Confession. One of my 
passages of scriptures that I used to really like was Matthew 23, 27, where Jesus accuses the religious hypocrites of his day of being whitewashed sepulchers, or we would say tombs that have been whitewashed to disguise the decay that's happening on the inside. Matthew puts these words in Jesus' mouth. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which on the outside look beautiful, but inside they are full of the bones of the dead and all kinds of filth. I think it's a first class insult, is it not? Okay, he was not, uh, he was real with that. So you might wonder, why in the world would I identify with that kind of a passage? It's not a particularly comforting passage. But the truth is, at the time, I was a very conservative Christian, and I was really into sin and salvation teaching. And I thought that I was this huge center, sinner just trying to pretend to be righteous. And maybe that was so, but the reality was I was pretending to be happy when I was not. And I pretended my life was what I wanted, but it was not. I identified at some level with the corpse inside the tomb. I felt stifled and like I was slowly dying. I was living out of a gendered role of society that was given to me and it wasn't working. I was locked into a world that I had not freely chosen. I was locked into sexual repression and ignorance that our culture mandates about our bodies. And I can assure you that this is a death-dealing, soul-killing power for me. I wasn't me. I was who everybody else said I should be. Such is the life of a hypocrite. But many of us live this way. Everything looks well on the outside, but on the inside, some of us are slowly dying. And the views of our so-called Christian culture about the body and women and pleasure and sexuality are part of the problem. That's the frame that we're going to be examining today. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit more about my frame. I was raised by parents who did not condone too much laughter for children. It was too loud, too distracting. In our world, too much pleasure was offensive. Instead, we were about work. This is called the Protestant work, work ethic, not play. So much religion condemns too much sensual pleasure, too many good times, lest it end up in irresponsible hedonism, right? After all, that kind of goes along with this stern father judge figure that we have who judges the quick and the dead and meets out punishment. So that kind of fits. So you got to work, work really hard, and don't play too much or don't have too much fun. But soul killing is what happens when we cut off from pleasure and when our intimacy is carefully controlled and always limited. And of course, there are penalties for too much pleasure and too much joy in our culture. But let's be clear, no one can dance or sing when judgment is close at hand. So here I was. I sang the songs I was supposed to sing for the church rather than my own song. I lived as others said I should in order to survive. It is, after all, safe to hide out in tombs. The only requirement is to keep it whitewashed so nobody, nobody, knows. nobody knows. But of course, when we choose to remain in the safety of a tomb, it is to choose spiritual death. However, the wider cultural context, when I think of my grandmothers and grandfathers and great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers in my world, the religious and cultural conditioning had been going on for generations. It wasn't new to me. In the quiet moments of my life, these grandmothers and grandfathers are in my veins. Cut off from pursuing too much pleasure, they were caught in an isolating rural mindset that said, expect little, get less, 
and accept whatever you get. And they all found themselves helplessly trapped in a narrow confines of prescribed roles of how they were supposed to be that promised them very little. Baby making trapped each one of those women in lives of drudgery that squeezed out the zest for life and sensuality. And baby making also is part of the unfortunately unhappy marriages. Childhood dreams were relinquished because of the baby making issue that could not be controlled. Enslaved, she to her husband and he to the drudgery of the role of provider, bound to the landlord who was the owner of the fields that he plowed. Then he was captured in an isolated manhood far from his children and his heart's desires and his dreams. A magic pill could not free them or me from the definitions of subservient womanhood, the carrier of man's desires, the breeder of progeny, the object to be preyed upon. My grandmother's names are barely remembered. <coughs> I carry this in my brain, and it flows in my bloodstream. <coughs> I'm going to ask Joy if you give me a glass of water. <coughs> so, <laughs> I realize this is all kind of negative, but I'm getting there. Just hang in there with me. <coughs> now, for others outside my cultural mindset, the stories of the ancestors of being trapped in other ways by the racism of the society that does not value certain bodies, it says you're less than, in fact, maybe not even nothing. You're just nothing. Violence externally inflicted on a whim or a pretext because they can get by with it. Men who could violate without punishment, and they did. The blood of the ancestors were, who were poor and drowned, trodden in most of our ancestry, came from warring countries where the elite held all the purse strings, and only the few could escape to a new land to try to survive. Immigrants all just trying to find work that kept their body and soul together, a roof over their head and bread on the table. Germans, Irish, Italians, Puritans, Mexicans, Guatemalans, El Salvadorans, Venezuelans, go on and on. Generations of traumatized people just trying to survive in an oppressive world where tyrants rule and the elite had long ago sold their soul to fattening, to fatten their land holdings and the portfolios. So they still run in our veins and they run in the church as well and our culture. And I have to wonder if some of the craziness right now and the insanity of the anti-COVID vaccination movement and the anti-democratic movement of, trying, of refusing to accept the democratic elected president is a part of the rebellion against that kind of containment, that kind of pain and suffering, the restrictions on pleasure, the emphasis on work, which is now mindless and low paying the limitations on intimacy, which is still very confined and repressive. The frame on how we see life through the eyes of the culture is limited, and too often the church has mimicked that. So that's what we're challenging, and it's time to see new dreams and to have new visions. So we're going to go back to Jesus. Now, Jesus lived in a time of lepers, and leprosy at the time, we read that they had to live apart from the community. They, had to, they were expelled to lepers' colonies, right? And when anybody got close to them on the, on the roads, they had to yell, leper, leper, unclean, unclean. Now, we know that leprosy was not highly, and is not highly contagious. We also know that it, that, that happened in a culture that had, in a religious culture, that had a mindset that some people are pure and some people are impure, and some people are clean and some people are unclean. And, and it was a way of controlling certain people. After all, if you had eczema, you had leprosy. If you had any kind of skin condition, you had leprosy, you see? So it was a catch-all phrase. 
So what happens when, that, when you get into that mindset is that you begin to think of yourself as diseased. And you got eczema. It's not a problem here. It's not a contagious, highly contagious disease. But you begin to assume the negative definitions that everybody lays on you. Something is inherently wrong. And unfortunately, much of the church has been invested in telling us that there's something wrong with you, sinners that you are. And by limiting pleasure, limiting and restricting bodies, and teaching that the body is a source of sin, unclean, unclean. Telling people we're all hopeless sinners in need of a drastic redemption keeps us from singing our own song. No one can dance or sing when judgment is close at hand. Repressing, restricting, judging, it all prevents the blossoming of the human spirit, which is how we were created to be. It keeps us from, it keeps us instead moving in lockstep, and you've never seen a soldier march in lockstep with a smile on their face. It doesn't happen. But that is, that's the frame of life in the world. But that is not the frame of one called Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. For eating and drinking and feasting and going to banquets was what his life was about. It was about an abundant life. He even went so far as to explain to the disciples how to behave during the banquet feast and where to sit. It's in Matthew. And so the, the disciples, and he was upending the rules. Life is to be lived because it's a gift. And Peter finally got the message through a dream after Jesus was gone from, and when, he, when Cornelius called him. And he tells Cornelius in Acts 10, God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. He got it. Took him a while, but he got it. So what we need is permission and encouragement to live our true lives, our perfect nature, freely as creatures made in God's image. Creatures who are made for joy and intimacy and pleasure and dancing. As Jesus touched the untouchables. They said, unclean, and Jesus reached in and touched them anyway, moving into their world, seeing the image of God that they were, every one of them, as we are, every one of us. Because belief in our leprous state is a lie. Belief that I deserve to live Dying in a cave or in a tomb is a lie. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? So, the truth is the unlimited frame. Laughter and music and joy is the gift of life. That's the rule, not the exception when you got your work done. It comes when we know that all is accepted, all is forgiven, all is well in the eyes of love. Smelling the lilies of the field being entranced by the birds of the air, touching the hands and shoulders of the neighbor and the friend. It's the rule of the sensual life of faith, not the exception. It is knowing that all is a gift. All this sensuality, all of this sexuality, gifts to be accepted and appreciated because it is good to live in these bodies. Showers of blessings all around us. And we need to emerge from our tombs into the daylight, with a living with abandon and confidence in the goodness of the Creator.
all is well in these bodies. All is well in these souls. Belief in our own inferiority and sinfulness and depravity of our sexuality is the lie. So how do we move out from under this oppression that's in our brains? How do we move out from the death-dealing ways of the tomb? How do we stop viewing ourselves as lepers who have to live with the label unclean? Lazarus, one of Jesus' friends, found himself inside a sepulcher. And Jesus called him by name and said, come forth. And then Jesus waited to see what would happen, as did the crowds. So we, too, are called to an abundant life. Come out of your tomb. Do we respond to the call of life by stepping out of these cultural prisons? From the lies we have told ourselves about our diseased spirit sexual selves? Can we take the risk to emerge from our tombs into the sunlight of a love that has no end? That indiscriminately pours out on all of our lives and our neighbors and on our enemies with equal power? A love that plays no favorites and plays no games? Can we risk following our hearts and our inner being instead of listening to the clamoring of our egos? Is it possible for humanity to get into these gloriously and wondrously made bodies so that we will become more creative, more intimate, more trusting, more empathic to others, more connected? Is it possible that by trusting in goodness and in one another, we will come to an understanding of a different kind of morality that it respects the stranger and that accepts and loves the enemy? Can we move into preserving Mother Earth for our great-grandchildren, not just because we want to save the life on Earth, but because it is a marvelous miracle this planet is? So, how did Moses get out beyond his frame? Enter the story of Moses. I'm going to suggest that he is was probably thinking he's a first-class hypocrite, as did I. He had his secrets. He dared not confess. His entire childhood and his adult life had been a sham. He was a man who was hiding out. No doubt he felt he lived in a white sepulcher. He had been bra if he had been brave and open, he would have had to declare with the lepers unclean because he had been born and enslaved to an enslaved Hebrew woman, mother who was the lowest of the low, and yet had been reared in a palace of privilege, and nobody knew. And he kept the secret because he didn't really belong there. And he had to keep a secret because the very people who were putting food into his Hebrew body were the very people who set into motion the killing machine that killed the babies of his childhood. He was painfully aware of what he was dealing with with the Pharaoh. Then one day, it all spilled out. And he saw mistreatment of the Hebrews one too many times. And he reacted in rage, and he murdered the perpetrator and then fled for his life. No longer safe in the Pharaoh's palace, he had escaped far away from the city life, and he was hiding out in the pastures with the sheep. The blood of the ancestors ran in his veins, enslavement, powerlessness, brutality of a power-hungry elite. Perhaps he too had adopted a saying, expect little, get less, accept whatever you get. Because ultimately he was unclean. He had learned that lesson every day of his life while living in the palace. And then one day, there was a burning bush. This is holy ground. The I am who I am says, take your off your shoes and listen, because I have work for you to do. So, I mean, bottom yeah. line, you're right. Not unlike you're Jesus, who said to Lazarus, come out of your tomb. Come out of the place of the shadows of death. Come out here. Take a deep breath. you got work to do. And you'll never hear any reports 
And then Jesus also said to the lepers, you're clean. Go to the temple and tell them you're clean. Come out of your tombs, Jesus says, of your hypocrisy and move into an abundant, sensual life of the Creator that has been made for you to enjoy. So Moses could have sat on his rock and ruminated about this strange thing he'd been seeing. He could have pondered the startling revelation for days, and he could rejoice at having been the recipient of this strange message. But Moses saw the burning bush and he did what he was told to do. He said, here am I, and that is what we are to do when we hear the message. Here am I, take off our shoes. So when I came out of my own hypocrisy and I stopped singing other people's songs, I began to sing my own. I laid aside the lie that I was unclean, and I began looking for sacred space. Burning bushes where holiness seems to be. Life, sounds, and places are sacred space to me. Take off your shoes, this is holy ground. It's in the living of our lives that mystery abounds. Snuggled in bed, all safe and warm, hearing the rumble of a loud thunderstorm, sitting by a campfire late at night. Hearing baby's laughter with innocent delight. Burning bushes where holiness seems to be. Life sounds and places are sacred space to me. You take off your shoes, this is holy ground. It's in the living of our lives that mystery abounds. Flowers and gardens are in my reach, drives to the country and a day on the beach. Here with my beloved by my side, remembering that I am loved gives me such delight. Life, sounds, and places are sacred place to me. Take off your shoes, be still now. This is holy ground. To see the sacred burning bushes in our lives is to see the change in the frame. It is to see the world through smoky haze of wonder and breathe in the presence of the holy in our nostrils. Can you see it? Can you smell it? Where is the I am who I am in your life, in your everyday, ordinary life? Is it the laughter of children? Is it the campfire? Is it the garden? Is it the flowers? Is it the touch of a neighbor? Is it the beloved by your side? Have you taken off your shoes so you can hear the message? Can you hear your name being called? Have you left your cultural tombs and moved into the space that is open to breathe in the freedom that is ours from a pleasure-seeking, pleasure-sharing creator? This love without end from the beginning of time till after we are gone. Simply because. How could anyone ever tell you that you were anything less than beautiful? The songwriter says, because with the help of those around us, unbind them and set them free. Right? Jesus said, and then cure the sick. 
and raise the dead and cleanse the lepers and cast out demons in my name, he said, and you will do greater things than these, he said. Living in the sensual gift of these bodies, a miracle of the planet in this holy, sacred ground. We take off our shoes and hear God calling our names. There's work to be done. For God is saying, let my people go. May it be so. Amen.